It has been quite a year. Our world has been totally upended in this last year. Between the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, political unrest, racial violence and injustice, the many natural disasters that have rocked different parts of the country, and whether or not you have experienced significant personal loss in this time, we all have been impacted. We all feel it. But I wonder if we've really made the time to process the many layers of loss and disappointment our world has experienced in this last year. Most of us tend to carry around a lot of grief that isn't dealt with, a lot of disappointments that are buried underneath our busyness and distraction. What do we do with all of the pain and the suffering our world has been experiencing in this last year? Could there be life on the other side of this? Could we even grow through a time like this? I believe the answer is yes, but it requires us to slow down and to surrender to God's ways of bringing growth. Jesus said in John 12 that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus was saying that the process of growth starts with the cross. He said these words in anticipation of his death, saying, Do you want to be fruitful? Do you want to make an impact on the world? Look at the process of how life works all around you and the things that grow. Any gardener will tell you that the journey of growth begins in a journey downward, in hiddenness, darkness, and death. A harvest begins with a single seed, and that seed was planted in the ground and had to die. The journey between sowing and reaping has been a fascination to me personally. I have considered the process that a seed takes under the soil, and this is the inspiration for the painting you see behind me called Seeds of Hope. What happens between sowing and reaping? Between the cross and the resurrection? There's a process a seed goes through that gardeners call scarification. Scarification is a journey a seed must go through in order to grow and produce fruit. It's the practice of breaking down and cracking a shell of a seed through external conflict, such as freezing and thawing temperatures, the singeing by forest fire, or being eaten and digested by animals. Yikes. You see, seeds are more or less water resistant. How long it takes to germinate depends on how long it takes for water to penetrate the shell to get to the internal part of the seed. After the seed's shell is cracked, water can then enter through the cracks. The seed coat swells and breaks under the pressure of the expanding seedling within. It explodes out of the shell into something new, something greater, and cannot be contained by its former shape. Sound familiar? I thought so too. You see, when we're cracked by suffering, we feel like we're dying. And actually, we are. Jesus said this is how transformation happens. The reality of how a seed works is this. It must be broken and crack open in order to grow into a plant and multiply. Pain, loss, failure, disappointments, these things crack us and our world open. But could it be that in the midst of the pain and vulnerability of this season, God wants to lead us to the cross in new ways so that he might transform us into something new through it? Jesus shows us that through the cross, suffering becomes the soil of transformation. The cross is where the journey begins and where God meets us in the hidden work of the heart. I love what Ashley Island says about this. She says the hidden work is the hard work is the heart work. In our hustle bustle culture, it is easy to pass over the suffering of others or even our own woundedness that we carry with us and pass on with business as usual. We can't afford to stop and do the work of grieving because we have work to do, right? But what if God was inviting us to stop, to enter the pain in a way that brings transformation, not only in us, but in our world? But this requires some intentionality. It goes against even the grain of how we were wired. You've probably heard of the fight or flight response, right? When pain hits us, it triggers a response in our limbic system. 
our heart rates increase, our blood gets pumping and moves us quickly to either want to fight the pain or flee from it. Now, while this reaction may be helpful in the case of, say, encountering a grizzly bear, it's not always so helpful in areas of addressing personal or communal communal loss, injustice, or conflict. All right, so let's talk a little bit about those of us who are fighters. I put myself in this category. If you're like me, I tend to fight the pain through my own efforts to try to fix the situation. If I could just work harder, come up with a better strategy, or control the situation, then I won't have to deal with the pain because I can minimize it. Or if I can't control the situation, I'll control the circumstances around it. When I'm going through something hard or faced with a difficult reality in the world, like the suffering of the poor or personal loss, I have been known to frantically clean the house. If I can't control the way I feel about this situation or what's happening in the world, at least I can control the tomato stains on my countertop. Anyone else with me in this? But maybe there are some of you who are runners. Maybe you try to escape suffering by staying busy with your work or numbing yourself through Netflix binges, alcohol, shopping, food, family, unhealthy relationships, and even serving in the church. But I think we know that these mechanisms often leave us feeling defeated, disillusioned, and worn out. Grief has a way of catching up with us. And fighting and fleeing from the pain are also rooted in a false narrative of who God is and who we are. In issues of racial injustice, for example, I can flee and fight in activism quickly. And while on the surface it may look like I have integrity in these actions, it's often rooted in pride and desiring to prove myself to my friends of color. That maybe I'm some kind of messiah that can save others. And this is scandalously prideful. How about those of us who run? Perhaps when we numb, we detach ourselves from pain and the pain of others. We think maybe if I don't engage it, then I can escape it. But sadness and anger are core emotions that rise within us when we, when we experience loss. It needs somewhere to go or it gets blocked. Blocked emotions eventually hurt us. They put stress on our mind and body and eventually cause symptoms like depression, anxiety, high blood pressure, stomach problems, and more. When we run from feelings of pain, we detach ourselves from our full humanity and miss out on deeper connection with God and others. Because connection can only emerge in the midst of our willingness to be vulnerable and bring our whole selves to the table, including our emotions. Sometimes when we run from the pain, we also miss out on the opportunity to experience God's healing and presence in the midst of it. And likewise, when we run from the pain in the world, we fail to enter the suffering of others and fail to love. This is rooted in fear and self-protection, not love. (sighs) We so often want to stay safe and strong within the shell by taking our very human approaches through suffering in fight or flight and the things we cling to for self-protection. Maybe we try to muscle through it and conquer it. We could try to be victorious over it or hide behind our fear. We think if I could just garner myself around these things, maybe I would be safe and maybe I would be strong and protected and maybe I could just patch up that crack. (sighs) But God says, no, I don't want you to stay in the shell. I have more for you. I will heal and shape you to become the fullness of who you were created to be. Let me in. Let me into that pain. Let me into the cracks, into your suffering, in in the suffering of the world. And I believe we allow and invite God into the pain through lament. Now, lament is a foreign word for most of us in the West. It's an obscure word. But what if I told you that 40% of the Psalms are songs of lament? 
What if I told you that churches and other cultures know how to lament intimately and practice it often? What is lament? Lament is where we cry out to God in prayer with all of our anger and all of our sadness and complain to him about the way things are. Where we come open with our broken and cracked shell before God and say, help. Lament is an act of surrendering to God in the midst of grief and sorrow. It exposes the darkness and brokenness of sin in the world and within us for what it is. In lament, we bring the suffering of the world to God and ask him to do something about it. And the mystery and the beauty of the gospel is this. It's in the very places of pain that God's living water and living breath are allowed in, allowed to heal us and cause us to grow. Suffering may crack the shell of our souls, but God's living water seeps into the cracks in our lament. It's where we experience Jesus as the Emmanuel, God with us in the darkness The God who left the throne of heaven to enter our dusty, messy world. He joins us in the darkness and says, here I am. And we receive the gifts of his presence, his healing, and his truth that seep in through the cracks. Lament is the antidote to fight or flight reactivity because it forces us not to run or fight the pain but to enter into it. And instead of grasping and controlling, we learn to release and receive. Lament is an act of letting go of all other messiahs that we try to cling to in order to save us. Our achievements, our circumstances, our relationships, our politics, our ministries, and even our compassion, all must be surrendered before God in lament. So, how do we lament? Well, in the biblical model, there are three main components to lament. The first part of every lament is a complaint, which is encouraging for some of us who have been in this place of darkness and suffering for a long time, right? It's where we look at the world and wrestle with God with all of the hard questions, where we ask things like political leaders abusing their powers, natural disasters, thousands of deaths to coronavirus, cancer, human trafficking. How could you let that happen? Where are you, God? Where are you? How long, O Lord? Where are you? Why? These are the prayers you pray in your complaint. And in lament, God welcomes the full breadth of our human emotions, our big feelings, our anger, our sadness, our frustration. He welcomes them and says, I know, I know, I know it hurts. I know it hurts, but let me in. Let me into that righteous anger because you're right. The world is broken. And this wasn't my desire for you or the world. This is not how I designed it to be. And this is not what I wanted for your story. It makes me angry and sad too. But guess what? I'm going to use it anyway. And the second part of lament is request. This is where we ask God to bring his kingdom to earth, to save, to heal, and do the work only he can do. It's where we pray, Jesus, would you bring healing? Would you? Would you bring reconciliation? Would you bring hope? Bring freedom and deliverance? Could you? Would you, God? Could you? Would you please? And the final is an expression of trust that says, Lord, I don't know when. And I don't know how you're going to come through, but I'm going to trust that you will. And the truth is, God doesn't often come through in the time or way that we want him to. There are some things, there are some things that we may not see fully restored into the redemption of all things. But in lament, we have the opportunity to surrender to God and say, I believe I believe in the one who surrendered to death and darkness, who entered our pain to heal us, and the one who was victorious over it. 
who will one day wipe every tear from our eyes and make all things new. And this is the God that we can pray, God, whether or not I see or understand, I trust that you love me. I trust that you're at work. I trust that you are working all things for your glory and your good, and that you will bring beauty and new creation in this time. Lament shifts our perspective off of ourselves and our view of the problem and onto God and worship. Lament is one of the most powerful forces we possess in the life of a believer because it changes our perception of reality. In the face of discouragement, in the face of uncertainty, we see the truth that we often miss by looking at our circumstances in our own perspective. In lament, we see our own sin. We see the pain of the world. We see the pain of those who are different from us. We see that there are forces, both good and evil at work that we cannot see with our own eyes. We see that we and our problems are really small. We see that we don't have all the answers and that we can't fix it. We see that we aren't the hero and neither are the people around us or our strategies, structures, or clever ideas. Only God is. And suddenly, when we see Jesus through his beautiful love expressed in the midst of brokenness, we see beauty in others. We see that even our enemies are worth dying for. And we also see how feeble our efforts are to try to fix the situation. We begin to see spiritual solutions to problems. He imparts to us new visions and dreams for ministries and the harvest fields and creative action we can take towards his kingdom where we serve. In lament, we surrender helplessly to God at the cross and say, God, I don't see the whole picture of why this is happening. Only you do. And God, I can't bring myself out of this situation. Only you can. He fills the cracks with his self. We rise and expand into a new self, a true self. The old self falls away and is discarded. And what rises in its place is breathtakingly beautiful. Recently, I listened to a Veritas forum, forum where Makoto Fujimara, a gifted artist, described the process of making kintsugi art. Kintsugi is the art of repairing shattered pieces of pottery by mending the areas of breakage with gold. Now, Fujimara works regularly in a kintsugi, with a kintsugi artist, and in his workshops, the kintsugi teacher would invite students to bring in broken pieces of pottery to his class. He would say to them, you came in to fix something, but we aren't fixing anything. We're gonna behold the fragments and the brokenness for a while. We're gonna look at the fissures and we're gonna hold it and then we're going to think about then making it new. Fujimara noted this is the proper way to lament. Is it possible that God could take the shattered pieces of our anger, our sadness, our loss, our disappointment, and our dreams and somehow mend them together to create new life? I believe he can, and I've seen him do it. During the pandemic, as an artist, I really struggled with how to respond amidst the chaos in the world. What role does an artist have in the wake of such suffering? God began to challenge me to bring the pain I was seeing in the world into the studio. He invited me to go deeper into lament than I had ever gone before, not for myself, but for our broken world, to sit and listen in the pain of others in order to stand in solidarity and prayer for people all over the world. And so in the face of incredible anxiety during the pandemic, I began to slow down and listen to my sister, a PA chief in the Royal Oak Beaumont, share her chaotic and traumatic experiences through the pandemic. I grieved through cries that could not be heard in words, but found their way out in paint. 
I lamented and prayed and petitioned God through painting her and the surrounding circumstances of chaos and darkness. And those paintings also put words to her own pain in a way that she needed. And as the waves of racial trauma began to roll in, I entered into grief and lament and painted that too. In the wakes of the deaths of Brianna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, I started painting while listening to a discussion of Black ministers respond to these losses and discuss the topic of racial trauma. As I listened, I was so grieved, and I sat deeply in the loss, at the helplessness, at the suffering, and what came out was a series of paintings titled Lament. Not long after that, George Floyd passed, and I wanted to respond by painting that chaos too and painting him. I wanted to look into his eyes and to see past the labels and the news articles about him. I wanted to see his humanity. I wanted to see the image of God in him and to grieve for what was lost. You see, when you paint someone's portrait, you get to know them. You study their face and their lines. You give careful attention to their skin color, the nuanced way light falls on their face, and you get a chance to see both their humanity and the image of an eternal God expressed through them. You get to see something far deeper to them than what is projected in the media. And that's what I wanted to do, to look deeply into George's face and really see him and to pray as I did. There's something mysterious that happens when we surrender to God in lament. In his beholding of all of the fragments and broken pieces with us, together he works to create something new through them. Andy Crouch has said, lament is the seed of creativity. It's the seed of genuine creative action. And I believe he's right. I believe God has all kinds of new creative ideas he wants to stir through our lament. The creative ideas that get unlocked in lament cannot, can only create beautiful things through us. But lament shapes us into the beautiful creations that we were meant to be. Our God is constantly creating beautiful things from the broken distorted, and damaged places in our world. It's his specialty. How much more then would he want to invite you to participate with him in that work? But that work of new creation emerges through uniquely how you are wired. It's something you discover along the way. And for me, painting sometimes feels like such a small act and light of such pain in the world, such overwhelming suffering and injustice. But I discovered that as I wrestle with God myself in lament, I can create space for others to do the same. What I discovered arising in me through lament was my true self. I began to awaken more to my role in his story, how he has uniquely wired me to respond to the brokenness in the world, not through striving or performing or fighting, but through simply responding to what I see, feel, and experienced. I started unfolding into my own creative potential and who I'm called to be. I began to see that while I'm not a doctor, and cannot heal physical needs, or a politician, or a lawyer who can work for justice, or a government, or justice system, I can create in a way that invites others to see, to lament too. We all have a tremendous empathy gap in our world. And by, create, by creating out of lament, I can invite others into the experiences and pain in a way that I hope can produce change. Recently, my lament paintings were used in a prayer room called Listen, Learn, Lament in Kalamazoo. They helped others to enter the African-American experience of pain and loss and cry out to God in lament, 
to awaken hearts towards change. And heart change leads to action. This is the dream God has put inside of me and awakened me to in lament. But what about you? Is it possible that the ache and the loss and disappointment cracks us open to reveal who we were made to be? What if suffering opens us and arises us to become the people we were created to be, the world we were created to be? And that journey begins in lament. Our world is asleep. And lament wakes us up to the pain in the world and within us that needs to be healed and changed. You can join in that work right now. So we're going to take some time to lament. And I want you to think of an area in your life or our world where you are longing for God to come through and pray a prayer of lament. Lament is risky. It is vulnerable to remain open to God in areas that we have been disappointed, that we are tempted to fight or flee. But we know God's, our prayers are precious to God and so are our tears. We can hold them like a seed before God and say, I don't know when you're going to come through. And I don't know what to do with this situation in my life or in our world. But I'm going to sow this soil and trust that you will come through somehow. I want to wait and trust you. In the Bible, there are two forms of lament. Personal lament that rises out of personal pain as individuals. And communal lent, lament is where we or we may not be the ones suffering, but we can join in community with those who are. And to pray on behalf of the ways our world has been broken by sin, death, and pain. You may be in a great season in your life. And perhaps you're minimally impacted by the losses, trauma, and violence in the last year. The invitation is for you to mourn with those who mourn. To enter lament is a discipline in our individualistic culture. It requires us to empathize and experience the pain of others totally unlike us. Communal lament can be an act of sharing in solidarity with those who suffer. And this session has an accompanying lament guide where you can write your own song of lament if you wish, or enter into lament through an art form such as music. I encourage you to set some time aside now to lament. Consider one area in your life where there is suffering or in the world and enter in the process. Let me pray for us as we do. Father, I thank you that you did not flee from pain, but that you chose to enter right in and that you can bring a resurrection through the suffering and pain in our world but it requires us to go to you in the midst of those places that can be hard, where we would rather run or fight. But Jesus, help us right now to engage with you in the process of lament. Help us to lay bare all of the emotions, all of the trauma, all of the loss before you and invite you in to heal us and help us to petition you, God, for the world that you are creating May we arise to become the people that you have created us to be through our lament. In your name we pray. Amen. This session is also connected to a a deeper guide that I have created called called the Seeds of Hope four-week guide through loss and waiting. So if you want to go deeper in this journey through some of the material that I have shared here with you, I encourage you to check that out. There will be a link in the handout, um, but you can also find it on my website. Take care.